Um, Wee! Wait, you go down, give it to her. Okay. So, because he will be around. Okay, so I'll just knock off there. And then. So, right at four o'clock, I start talking. Right at four o'clock. Right at four o'clock. I don't think that should be there. Angela, do you want to take that so it's not on the... Hello? Sound quite as grandiose, but <laughs> at least it'll give me something to start with. <laughs> yeah, and then I'll get it wrong. So, our next speaker is Rich Waldron. He is one of the co-founders of Trade.io, which is a platform for web app development. Rich will be talking to us about how selling Wellington boots led to a build-up in a startup of Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley. Right, <laughs> over to Rich. Cool. Thank you very much. 
So yeah, uh, as just said, uh, I'm Rich. I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, my company, Trade.io, and uh, the journey we've been on from going from basically nowhere to the heights of Silicon Valley and, and one of the biggest uh, incubators in the world. Firstly, the story is actually classified. I, I'm denied quite a lot about whether or not I should tell quite a lot of this, because when we were kind of going through our journey, I often looked at other startups and kind of figured, how did they get through that part? Or is it really as hard as it feels like it is for me? And I felt that by being able to tell a bit about what we've done, that would perhaps help some other people. So we'll start off with the founding team. Uh, there's three of us, Dominic at the back, uh, Ali in the middle, and we've got that kind of blend that uh, Rich and Robin were just talking about in that Ali's our hacker, I'm the hustler, and Dom's the sort of hipster slash business guy. The whole thing started uh, way back in 2008. So myself and Alistair have been friends for a long, long time, about 10 years, and uh, we both got fed up with our jobs. Quite regularly, I was pulling this pose at work. Um, I was really fed up with the kind of the daily grind. I didn't really feel like it was really going anywhere. And we had all these product ideas that were kind of burning a hole in our pocket at the time. So we decided in our spare time to start building blogs. Um, first off, we figured that this thing would go absolutely global. If we made a blog about how to make money from blogs, everyone would want to read that. Uh, the problem is we hadn't ever made any money from blogs. So we actually built a blog about nothing. So that one failed. Uh, then we decided, okay, great, everyone likes TV shows. We'll write uh, a blog about TV shows. People will go on there, we can sell advertising, we'll probably make a ton of money. Yeah, that, that didn't work out so well either. Uh, so then we moved on to gigs, because everyone likes to go to gigs. And if we use the Ticketmaster API and we could deliver all this information directly to you, um, everyone would go through and, and pay to use our platform. That one didn't work. So we moved on to Christmas presents. Um, by now, you can see we've been going for about six months. We've tossed away a ton of ideas. And now we figured everyone was gearing up to buy presents for people for Christmas. And we'd be the right resource to tell them how to do that. Unfortunately, uh, we were never very good at buying presents ourselves. So no one really cared about that one either. Finally, we came up with this idea to launch a, uh, a website for going to festivals. So we figured, right. This will be the place where everyone will go, find out the location, find out the lineup. Everyone's going to go on our blog. We'll make a ton of money. Uh, yeah, that, that wasn't so good either. So we built all these sites in our spare time, um, staying up all night, going to our jobs in the day, literally pushing them out, expecting them to kind of take over the world. And every single time, nothing happened. Then the iPhone kind of came out, and uh, the App Store was available for us to build apps on. So we built this um, alarm clock app back in the early days. There was no real nice alarm interface. We designed a really nice visual way that you could actually change the theme and, and set the clock up. Uh, and we had this hack that basically linked to, uh, through PayPal so you could buy more themes from the web. Uh, we got that online. Uh, we started to make a nice bit of revenue from it. Um, unfortunately, uh, in-app purchasing didn't really exist at the time, and, and Apple weren't particularly keen of it. So they booted us straight off the App Store. So we kind of came to this head. Um, Ali had been doing research at Southampton for a number of years. He was in the Web Science Initiative with Tim Berners-Lee and doing all these really interesting projects. Um, I'd been working for a startup in the local area. And we'd sort of been trying all these bits and pieces to launch our own company, but nothing had come of it. Um, Ali got offered a, a huge amount of money to go and join a company in London and decided to take off. Um, I decided just to quit my job with, with no real plan. I just wanted to find a different way that I could go about the nine to five. That's when I got introduced to Dom. Uh, Dom had started up a web agency, um, which for somebody that didn't really know a great deal about technology probably wasn't the smartest move. However, what he did know about was products. Uh, he'd built a really successful student ticketing app while he was at university. Um, that had paid for him to be able to set up this agency. And rather than go down the sort of traditional routes of fundraising, he figured that by setting up a web agency, in the downtime from the client work, he'd be able to build any kind of product he liked. He'd have developers, he'd have designers, and it was a really nice way to kind of go about it without going through the grind of, of raising money. So I kind of came on board, we teamed up, and we started this little agency in the middle of nowhere, um, hired a couple of people with a bit of money that we borrowed. We borrowed about £10,000. Um, we won a couple of projects, uh, and we ended up sort of doing quite well. We scaled up to getting innocent drinks, Krispy Kreme, some really sort of high-end clients, and started producing quite a lot of sort of high-end service work. But ultimately, that meant we never really got to build any of our own products, which was actually the whole point of this operation. 
We had the luxury of being able to go and pitch at places like this. Um, this is an actual photo from walking into a room, seeing about 30 people sat the other side of us, and us expecting to pitch with an overhead projector about a new website for, for that client. Over time, we actually scaled things up a little bit. Um, the business started to do a little bit better, and we realized, okay, well, if we get a second office, maybe we could look into actually launching some of these products we've been talking about for a little while. So we made what seemed like a genius decision in launching a print magazine. Um, when I say print magazine, I actually mean we had 50,000 of these going out every month within Hampshire uh, in the local area. Hampshire isn't particularly advanced when it comes to technology. And we de developed this website that allowed all of our advertisers to kind of claim their vouchers for advertising that they got delivered through their door with this magazine online. That was great. Um, this magazine actually started pricking up quite a lot of traction. We had some pretty decent advertisers in there. We had Citroen, Sony. Um, we were really good at selling people the dream, even though this thing was being sold in like gyms and, and supermarkets and, and really not very luxury areas. Um, Alongside doing that, there was another local magazine in the area that was run by a very affluent man. Uh, the magazine was the ugliest thing you've ever seen. And when we got one through the door, that was actually our inspiration for, well, perhaps we could kind of take this guy on. We, we know we've got the design skills. We know we've got the tech background. We could probably go head to head. Yeah, unfortunately, he wasn't too keen on the idea. And uh, he actually tried to sue us. Um, for everything you could imagine. He tried to sue us for the name of our product, um, the fact that we were trying to rip him off in his local area. Uh, he then tried to take all our staff. He rang up all our advertisers and was selling advertising at 10 pounds a page when we were charging 1,000. He basically tried to run us out of the area that we're in almost entirely. Uh, then I started coming to the office and seeing people pulling the pose that I was pulling when I was working in a startup uh, about a year and a half before. And Really, we sort of had this epiphany of we've just spent a year and a half trying to avoid raising money to build products, and we never actually built a product. We just started doing businesses, not for the sake of feeling the passion towards them or actually wanting to build them, just to try and earn enough money to be able to you know, follow our dream. So we ended up downsizing. Um, we passed off a lot of the projects. We wound down the agency and let some of the staff kind of take it over. I started buying shoes and selling them out the back of my car. Um, and we just literally looked for any way that we could kind of stay alive, keep the company going, keep plugging away with these different ideas that we had uh, with the development team that we got together. It was at this point that I started ringing Ali, um, telling him he was a sellout and he should never have gone to London, and promising him that we could start a company in this shed that we'd hired with all these shoes in the background. Uh, because we were starting to churn enough money from selling Wellington boots on eBay that actually we didn't have to worry about some of the overheads anymore. So whilst I was queuing up in the post office every day um, with piles and piles of Wellington boots, Ali was starting to write code. Um, we'd had this idea that there was a nice way for us to arrange events with our friends. Uh, we wanted a, an offline planning app, a way that it came out of email so that when somebody said, do you want to go on a holiday or do you want to go for a meal? It, it, you didn't get these ridiculous email threads. <laughs> this guy's doing press ups, that's nice. Um, <laughs> so we built this app, uh, we shut ourselves away, coded the thing up entirely and ended up with this beautiful interface that allowed you to suggest events to your friends, ping them out to everybody, they could all vote on the outcome, and it took the whole decision process out of uh, email and, and out of your inbox. We made a couple of fundamental mistakes with this in that um, we actually developed the entire thing, design, um, the full back end, every single social feature you could imagine, as far as even building an, an iPhone app without actually showing a single person. So we spent about seven months, did no user testing, didn't even see if anybody else actually wanted this at all. Um, and when we launched it, we were actually a bit lucky. We did manage to pick up about 10,000 users, um, but the retention was awful. People basically signed in, tweeted that it looked lovely, sent it to their friends, nothing really worked, and then they kind of left again. But that experience really kind of um, gave us a kick. We realized actually the mistakes we've made in the past, where, where we ought to go in the future. And uh, we saw this advert for something called Springboard, which is a bit like Wayrer and Seacamp and has now become Techstars. So we put in an application. Um, at the time, 
Dom wasn't uh, around and wasn't available to do the video interview. Ali refused to actually be in the video. So I replaced Dom with a large octopus, uh, did the whole thing on my own, and we somehow managed to get accepted. So we all moved up to London. Um, we travelled about 130k from Southampton. Uh, by this point, we hadn't paid ourselves for about a year. Um, we had this app that sort of worked but didn't really. Uh, but we had about three months to figure it out. So first day at campus, we rolled in, introduced ourselves, showed everybody the app that we knew was failed and pivoted on day one. We came up with this idea um, based on actually the, the people that were using the platform. Rather than running out and just building something, this time we spoke to all the people that had tried to use our service before. Why did you sign up? What did you want to use it for? What was your motivation? Um, you know, what would you like to see it do? What was, what was the, the pain point for you? And we started to realize that actually the thing that everybody liked was coming out of their email. They didn't want all these messages that were clogging up their inbox. And they actually wanted a smarter way for uh, this, these messages to be handled. So delving into some of uh, Ali's background, we came up with this idea that if we could connect up to your email, we can learn a lot from the way people are interacting. We can see, OK, this person's emailed you. And in Salesforce, they're your hottest sales lead. And your calendar shows that you're in a meeting. So we can use all this contextual data to make decisions really quickly. We can say, well, if this is happening, send that person a text message. Pull them out of the meeting. And uh, you know, they can get on the, call, get on the phone and, and deal with that sales lead. So we built a really, really rough version of this product. Um, we've got a, a core set of people using it. By doing that, we went you know, to everybody we knew, people that were in you know, banking jobs, um, through to like lawyers, every single person we came across, we tried to learn a little bit about them and, and their inbox. And we got them sort of slowly using uh, this you know, really rough version of the product. That led us to being offered our first term sheet. Um, we met some investors as being part of the program. We didn't really have much of a product at the time. Uh, the thing that we did have was a team with a bit of tenacity, technical skill, design skill, product skill, and hustling ability. And we really sort of put this package together to show what we could do, show that you know, this is where the product was going. We had this interest here. We had a few people lined up to pay. And we really you know, managed to convince some people that if you back us, this is going to go a long way. Um, we negotiated this term sheet without really speaking to anybody. We, f you know, we figured we were smart enough to do that. And uh, we, we, you know, it came back through. We all sort of went out and celebrated, and, and everything was going to come true. Uh, and then we actually read some of the terms um, in the term sheet. And um, we actually realized that had we completed and, and signed this document, our company would have essentially been over. Um, some of the terms in there were, would have you know, really hindered us going forward. It restricted how we could have spent the money. There were certain caveats or milestones. It got really you know, tricky for us to actually be able to take that cash and continue to grow the business. On the flip side, we had no money in the bank whatsoever. So we were in this weird position of there's money on the table, but we can't take it. And there's nothing here for us. You know, we can't really survive much longer. Then came along um, a YouTube show called This Week in Startups with Jason Calacanis. Uh, this is a show that goes out on YouTube. It's, it's very popular in the US and, and in Europe. Um, Jason Calacanis is a pretty known sort of web celebrity. We got pushed into doing this show. We were suggested to go and pitch and, and try and get on the program. Uh, we turned up at this event in London, pitched the product, showed a bit of what it could do, um, got voted uh, the top product in London. They, we then went up against a couple of other countries in Europe, and uh, they picked the top three that all went onto the live show. Um, the live show went really well for us. We ended up actually being voted the winner of the show, and Jason Calacanis said he'd personally invest. We sort of had all this hype around us, all these people talking about us. Um, I started getting phone calls from investors in San Francisco. Yeah, everything seemed like an absolute whirlwind, and all the things that we'd sort of done in the past, we felt had, had had some value by this point. So we turned up at the demo day on Springboard, um, armed with the knowledge that we had an armful of investors chasing us, all wanting to offer us money. Um, we knew that we'd be fine. We felt really comfortable about this whole thing. Uh, so we were you know, fairly sort of nonchalant in, look, you can try and invest in us if you like, but the round's full. Um, if you want to get in, you, know, you have to come and talk to us. But you know, really, uh, there isn't any more room. So sort of taking stock at this point, um, we finished Springboard. Uh, we had a ton of investor interest. 
we were actually so broke that uh, Ali couldn't pay his rent, but we had all these US guys, so you know, nothing could go wrong. So we lined up the US trip. Um, everything was coming together. We thought, great, here we go. We're going to fly over to the West Coast. We're going to go and uh, meet up with this guy called Greg Curry, uh, Elon Musk's right-hand man. I had a f couple of phone calls with him. For ev every day for two weeks, I spoke to him. He sat in his Tesla shirt his, as he was their first investor in his Miami beach house. Uh, he lined up this string of investors along the West Coast that we were going to go and sort of fly out to see. So I was kind of making plans to get out there, borrowing a bit of cash um, to you know, get on the plane and, and head over. And uh, Greg just completely disappeared. Uh, this guy stopped taking my phone calls, uh, just c nothing. So looking at that, um, I had Ali and Dom sort of sat in this room really excited. We were sort of walking around feeling like you know, we, we were worth a million dollars. And uh, this guy had secretly sort of just completely cut us off. So, you know, what happens now? What, what are we going to do? Well, I turned to Hacker News. And uh, the top story that night was actually that uh, this guy, very tragically, had gone out for a, a meal after our last phone call and uh, had a heart attack. Um, so at that point, you can't go back to the UK investors because you've already told them that all these US guys are coming in. You can't speak to any of the US guys because the guy that was leading you to them and was the lead investor has um, tragically just died, which is a pretty awkward conversation. Uh, so you, you're pretty much stuck in a place where there's loads of people that think you're a really big and interesting company and you've got a ton of investment, but actually you haven't got any and you're borrowing money to pay for your co-founder's rent. So that was us. Um, actually last summer in this position, um, we really didn't know where to go at that point. Uh, if you'd looked at us from the outside in, you'd have thought, wow, this company is flying. You, you could read all about us on AngelList. We were the top trending company. Um, uh, we had quite a few users signing up. We had no real way of, of making revenue. But behind the scenes, we were in absolute turmoil. So then, um, because I'd planned to go out to the US, I started ringing British investors and in, in San Francisco. And, and my pitch was very simple. It was. Uh, we're flying out to come and see all these US guys. That was a slight lie because obviously they weren't there anymore. Um, perhaps you could like put me up or show me around. We could go for coffee. I'd really like to get a feel for the area. One of them was uh, Addie McLaughlin from Huddle, who actually said, oh, don't worry about that. I'm in London. Why don't you pop over to the office? Um, we'll grab a cup of coffee. Tell me a bit about what you're doing, and I'll see how I can help. So I went over for a cup of coffee with Andy, uh, explained what had happened, showed him the product, gave him a demo. And he wrote us a check on the spot. Um, absolutely bewildering. Loved the pitch. Wasn't really too bothered about the due diligence or any of the backstory to it. Just really kind of felt something with us. And uh, wrote us a check for £25,000 as, as an angel investor without really worrying too much about any of the other hassles. He then suggested, right, well, how do we, how do we help you guys scale to the next level. Now you've got you know, enough money for probably a couple of months at most. Um, you're going to need to bring in some more investors on board. You've upset quite a few in the UK, so what are we going to do? So we looked at AngelPad. Um, AngelPad is probably in the top two incubators in the world, um, depending on who you speak to, uh, up there with Y Combinator. It's run by this guy, Thomas Court, who was in the first 20 at Google. Um, and we'd actually applied to be on this program a year ago and, and been rejected. Um, this, this time, uh, when we applied, actually all the spaces were closed and the applications were closed. However, um, I did not let up on this guy. Literally emailed him every day, found out his phone number, did whatever I could just to get a bit of time with him, try and see if there's a way I could convince him to put us on this program. So he ends up getting fed up with me and, and arranging to have a Skype call. Uh, we had a Skype call, I showed him the product, we went again back through the platform and, and everything that had happened, and he told me, yeah, that's no problem, I'll give you a call, I need to talk to my wife about it, who he runs the program with, and uh, we'll pick things up from there. So I was like, great. I then spent the next two to three weeks basically waiting for this guy to call me, staying up all night on four occasions when he said, oh, I'll ring you tomorrow, I'll ring you tomorrow, this is you know, coming on, coming on, coming on. Um, the program was due to start in mid-September, it got to the end of August. The whole thing, in my eyes, was dead. We sort of carried on with the product and, and tried to forget about everything else that was happening uh, until about four days before the actual uh, program began, I picked up a phone call. Um, in the middle of the day, wasn't expecting it at all. 
uh, and he had you know, a very few simple words to say to me. Uh, hey, Rich, sorry I've been really busy. Program starts in four days. You guys are on. See you there. I was like, this is amazing. Um, so you know, where do we stay? What happens? He was like, you'll figure it out. Hung up the phone. So <laughs> by this point, um, I have to ring the other two guys who uh, haven't told their girlfriends, um, haven't prepared anybody for the fact that we may have to move to the other side of the world and uh, break the news to them that in three days' time we were expected to be on this program where we were going to be living for the next three and a half months. Um, we barely had enough money for the flight, so that was going back. We actually won some web work to pay for that. Flew out, managed to find a house on Craigslist and uh, made it out to Angel Pad for the first day. So we were then on this program on, on San Francisco. Um, it was just phenomenal. I think everything that we'd spent all our time working up to uh, had kind of paid off. Uh, we picked up a bit of investment for going on, on the program itself. Um, we had access to you know, top guys at Dropbox, Google, Salesforce. Anyone you wanted to get into, you could go and spend time with. Uh, we really evaluated every single part of the product, kind of went through quite a painful experience of uh, is this the thing that we want to spend the next you know, 10 years of our life working on? Uh, is, the, is the user acquisition numbers there? Are, are, do we actually see growth? Can we, are we going to get any revenue from this? And we really sort of dug in and, and really struggled really for quite a long time within, within this program, um, wrestling with were we doing the right thing? Is, is this the right way to go? And, uh, and really what happens next? That was obviously followed up with... Uh, a bit of sightseeing, some ridiculous breakfasts, and uh, Ali adopting this pose throughout almost the entire program. We also got to do um, an interview with Robert Scoble um, that went out kind of across all the Rackspace channels that picked up again a, a ton more interest for us and, and helped us with our, with our fundraising. And we completed our second demo day uh, within six months. So we were kind of accelerated out by this point. Then came essentially a pivot. Um, and this is really a classic example of where, from the outside in, every single startup looks, and I think Rich and, and Robin sort of touched on this a little bit, everything looks really calm. You know, you look at this company and think they've had all this interest, everything's going really well, they've moved to San Francisco, there's lots of people saying nice things about them on Twitter, but actually, you kind of know it's not like that. And you're constantly evaluating. You're trying to learn from every bit of data point that is available to you. That is a, a really key lesson to pick up from this whole journey, especially something that we've um, really sort of been schooled in, is making sure you're evolving and testing your assumptions at every point. Um, we actually came to realize that whilst people liked the fact that you know, they could do stuff with email, the real problem here was getting the data from uh, different APIs and making that accessible to the average user. Everybody has all this information stored about them and they love the fact that, oh, I can actually find out who my hottest sales lead is and compare it with this other bit of information over here. And then we had some businesses come to us and say, well, this is really nice with an email, but if you could offer this to me uh, you know, across some other platforms and in a different medium, you know, we'd pay you for this. So this time, uh, we actually went out and closed a few deals. We actually went out and took money for a product that didn't exist on the basis of, if we can do this, which is the data that you want, we'll be able to um, you know, provide you with this information. Uh, the outset to them was, oh great, these guys will do it, they've already built the platform for it. Internally, we were like, well, we, we haven't built any of this, but you know, we've proved that there's definitely a market here and, and we can go on with that. So we came up with this really nice way for building a very simple app to get data out in three simple steps. First step, uh, we pre-integrate a whole load of different application services and make a nice visual drag and drop interface for you to go and build a very simple workflow. This is a, an email example, but when I get an email, it contains an attachment, save it into Dropbox. This can be anything. Um, for example, within our fundraise, we were doing comparisons between people that had signed up to our product with investors on AngelList that have over 200 followers and invest in our sector. We'd be able to basically build that query out on our platform, run it, get the data sheet out, and then go and contact all these people and know that they were completely in tune with what we were trying to do. Secondly, you can deploy it in one click, push it straight online. And thirdly, you can share it and actually allow people to pay for the app that you've built through our platform. Um, this product actually started earning revenue from day one. Um, everything that we kind of learned 
through the last year and a half and all the pain of, of selling welly boots out of a car, um, losing an investor, um, failing on three or four, well, actually probably 10 different products if you, if you count them all together. We felt we were a little bit um, sort of smarter by this stage and we actually made some pretty key decisions early on in, right, now we know we have revenue here, let's focus on this point, let's bleed it out and see how far it can go. What market is there for this? How far can we take this? Where can it go next? Um, that led us to actually closing out our funding round uh, in June of this year. Uh, we picked up investment from some of the best guys in Europe. And the key really from this point was continue to grow, to con continue to scale, but remember all the lessons that have come through the last sort of year and a half. The real takeaway from all this is never give up. I think for us, um, there are so many occasions where we could have just stopped. You know, the amount of times we literally had no cash whatsoever, but everybody else thinks that we could have money. For example, not being able to go to a meeting about selling a new website because we don't have enough petrol in our car, not being able to pay rent. Like, it, all this stuff happened throughout the whole process. And I think the fact that the core founding team were all in this together and knew what was going to happen uh, meant that we could never stop. There was no way that we'd even consider you know, not building this company. The second one is um, you don't have all the answers. And actually, for a long time, uh, I really struggled with reading stuff on TechCrunch, Hacker News, The Next Web, all these different platforms where it seemed like I was doing everything wrong. You'd read you know, one person's opinion and suddenly I was like, well, we should be doing this over here. We should be going over here. And actually, you come to realize that a lot of those things are written by people that don't know either. Um, the best thing you can do is, is go with your gut, speak to people that have been through the, pr uh, the process themselves, find advisors, find people that can actually say, look, this is, what, this is what happened to us here, and perhaps you could you know, learn from this experience. But really, don't worry about not knowing what happens next. And the third one is actually building a network of other people. Um, this one really helps when all the chips are down and you've got no one to turn to, especially if you're a, a single founder. Uh, being able to speak to other people that are in the same position and being able to be open with them, there's a real uh, sort of trait that I've noticed, especially in Europe, where people kind of clam up and they don't talk to each other, they're not prepared to collaborate or share in the same way that it happens in, in San Francisco. There's a lot of worry about people knowing what's really going on. And actually, being able to share stuff and being able to kind of release some of those fears is, is what keeps you going when it gets really, really tough. So that's really a summary of our entire journey to speak. Um, there's absolutely no reason for this other than the fact that it really entertains me as a picture. I'd love to take any kind of questions or you know, if there's anything that um, I can sort of clarify from our journey. Uh, the caveat is you know, we certainly don't have all the answers and, and you know, we're really at the starting point here. We've, we've, got a, we've finally got a product that's growing in the right direction, that's picking up revenues, but you can see from the last year and a half there are a whole host of errors and misfortunes along the way. You said when you started in the accelerator, when you yep. started in the accelerator in the UK, you went and went out and spoke to lots of customers to find out actually how yep. they found using it. Have you got any practical tips on good ways to do that? I mean, did you literally just call them up, or yeah, um, just email them, or to bombard them until they talk yes, to you? Yes, actually, there's a that's a good question. There's a few things we did in there. Um, we built a landing page which made it look like the entire product existed. So again, a bit like the other uh, the other guys spoke about. Um, you could click through the pricing, you could click on every element of the product, but there was nothing behind it. All we were doing is tracking clicks. The goal was to try and take email addresses at the end. Um, we used that to get people on Skype, try and meet them for coffee, any way that we could basically bribe someone to speak to us. Something that worked really well is um, being kind of personal and saying, look, I'm a, I'm a founder starting out this company. Um, it would really help me kind of build and grow where we're going. If you could spend a, you know, 10 minutes of your time sat down with me telling me a bit about your email inbox or the way that you deal with this problem. Um, using tools like LinkedIn, uh, paying for premium and being able to source you know, a whole different uh, set of people in your specific customer area and then using connections that you already have to like get introductions to those people. Introductions are really strong and being on an accelerator gives you that massive network from the off, so you can then go and tap into uh, all of the past cohorts, all of the mentors, anyone that's been involved with, with that um, accelerator. 
they will they will provide you with links to people, but they're not going to do it unless you ask them. So, uh, literally every every single way you can think from harassing people on the phone, like sending them emails, turning up in offices and and, and asking if you could spend you know ten minutes interviewing people, uh, trying to collate that data in, in as much uh, quick way as possible. So you've been through about, I'd say, from what I can see, maybe about seven businesses. Yeah. And through trial and error, you've kind of seen, like, what works. Would you say, do you have any advice on how to do that from, like, for people who haven't been through that many businesses? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. So um, uh, when we first started out, uh, we figured that the, the way to do this was build a consumer product that we could get a million people to use and everything would kind of be rosy. Um, what you can kind of see has happened over time is we've moved towards a product where you can get people paying from day one. Finding a way that actually you can either get some revenue or get to the point where you know someone's going to actually put their card in and, and pay for your service. Um, definitely when we very first set out, we really figured that the free route would be the, the easiest way for us to go. And we thought if you just build a big consumer tool that does one thing really nicely, that's a, that's a great way for us to scale up. Actually, my advice on that is, um, if it's your first company and, and you, know, you perhaps don't have the reputation to raise money and, and you're not as well known, building a, a product whereby you know you will get paid for it very quickly uh, it is a huge way forward. It makes such a difference with every conversation you have. If you can show, you know, even if it's five people are paying me $10 a month for this service, that is such a compelling metric versus, well, we've got 100 users and they use it you know, once a month or whatever it might be. Actually getting people to put their card in, type the numbers in and submit it, um, it, it makes a huge difference. And so looking at our kind of products over time and, and starting out with blogs, building a planning tool, even the email service really, getting somebody to pay for an email add-on when email is free is tough. Finding a, a gap where you can actually see, if I build this product, I already know that these people are going to pay for it. And if you can prove that assumption before you've even built it, even better. Uh, we did that. Uh, by sort of having the email product and then ringing up the customers of it and delving into some of their other problems to the point where we were able to actually take money before we'd built anything. Uh, quite a few of the companies we knew from AngelPad and, and some of the you know, past guys on that have got amazing success stories of actually racking up you know, tens of thousands of dollars worth of business without actually building anything. Just by finding out what the pain points were, what the problems were, coming up with an idea for a solution and saying, if we build this, you know, would you commit to paying X amount of money for it? That's a really strong indicator that you're, you're on the right track. Cool. All right, I guess that's it. Can I just say thank you very much again, Mr. Rich Waldron, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.